Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Senate Health and Welfare Committee meeting. It is January 20th. And this morning, we are looking at Medicaid a little bit with our experts in that area, Nolan Langwell and um, Ashley Berliner. And I'll let you each introduce yourself, and then we'll hear your, tes your testimony, your information. It's not really, it is testimony, but it's really uh, critically important. Great. Uh, for the record, Noel Langwell, to my fiscal office. Um, so I invited Ashley to do this with me uh, for the third time for multiple reasons. One is um, um, she's the expert on a lot of what we're going to be talking about, but also like I think it's really good for folks to start seeing who the brilliant people are behind the veil that are doing a lot of the, the work of things that, that make Vermont tick. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and I also say that, you know, I think after today, I think we'll be I think you'll be done with me for a little while in terms of bombarding you with information. Um, and I'm sure you'll be thankful for that. <laughs> but we'll have you back to clarify everything we don't know, yeah. right? Good. The other thing I want to say is like I have a bunch of slides from the beginning. I'm going to go through them really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's repeat, and it's also me telling the story. But also, what's also happened is the global commitment stuff is in the, is a, towards the end, and that's the stuff I really want you to hear about. Okay. But, uh, so I want to kind of tell you a quick story to get you there, to make sure you have enough time, that there's enough time for Ashley to walk you through global commitment and for there to be questions. So if you have questions, I would uh, ask that we keep them quick. <laughs> All right, we'll hold, and we can hold quite, unless it's a clarification yeah. of what's there, why don't we hold the questions yeah. and, you know, write, write down your... So I really want to get the global commitment. Good, but okay. I'm going to get there quickly, so so if I go, and then write your question now, we can revisit it if there's time at the end. Sure. So, again, this is meant to be a high-level overview of global commitment. So I start by just showing you again, here's our, here's our chart that you've seen before. We're going to be talking about that 24% of, of Vermont rates in the Medicaid piece. Again, I've told you that the reason I threw this in here is I was telling you the story, if you remember, of how, you know, it used to be in 2008, 30% of Vermonters had some form of government coverage. Um, and now in 2021, 45%. So we've seen a shift. You've seen the Medicaid um, numbers go from 16% of Vermonters to 24% of Vermonters between 2008 and 2021. Uh, this one you can ask, well, don't ask too much questions about this, but <laughs> um, high level, you know, um, you know, the, the Medicare and Medicaid, there's a difference between them, and they're easily confused because their names are both so close together and they cover a lot of the same stuff. Um, so I've been doing this for this third time I've done it, and every time someone has sent me some kind of like little trick, like, oh, this is how we remember it. So my favorite, though, uh, I think it was Senator Gold, uh, Representative Goldman, she said, remember, Medicare ends in E for elderly. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, then someone else said, so I, I like that. But Mostly maybe, no, yeah. uh, elderly. elderly. I think uh, it's, some it's, it's, right? it's 55, I think, you come on. <laughs> not quite elderly, but elderly. Uh, I'm not 55 yet, so. I'm only 29, remember? And um, so the difference is Medicaid is state and federal program. Medicare is federal only. So we do not have any influence, say, or whatever over Medicare. We only control Medicaid if the state level through the state budget. Medicaid is for low income. Uh, it's for children, adult, 65, older, blind, or disabled. Medicare is all income. It's just 65 or older. Uh, any age with, or, or any age with end state renal disease or if you have certain disabilities and you're under 65, you can be on it. But most importantly, the thing to remember, I think, is that Medicaid is a thing that we have some influence to the budget. Medicare is federal, and that's out of our hands. Those are good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So real background, Medicaid started in 1965. It's a public health program for low-income individuals and families and individuals with disabilities. Again, it's financed through a state, federal, uh, state, federal state partnership but administ and administered by the states. And I'll get into a little bit more details in a few slides here. Each state designs and operates its own program with broad federal guidelines. And there's this joke is, you know, you, you heard me still this joke, and I think that after you hear the global commitment talk, after actually you, this, this little line will make more sense and be funnier. 
But if you've seen one Medicaid program, well, then you've seen one Medicaid program. And ha ha, I think that's hilarious. You don't yet, but you will. Probably. And if that doesn't work, I'll tell you I actually. totally think it's hilarious. See? Because this is our seventh time here in this presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nationwide, there's 90 million folks who have, uh, are on Medicaid in Vermont. The number is 208,000. Vermont has received some form of Medicaid assistance. Again, I think I talked about this last time. There's the have some form of assistance versus those who are on Medicaid. One third of folks have assistance, but a quarter are on as a primary. So of that 208, 163,000 have as a primary. And the rest are some form of like um, premium assistance or prescription drugs, et cetera. Um, so eligibility, when I think about eligibility, I think about, or when I think about coverage, I think is who is covered and what is covered. Um, so for the who, in order to qualify, you have to be a Vermont resident, uh, you have to be U.S. citizen, permanent resident, or non-citizen with lawful presence. Um, your financial situation will be characterized as low income or very low income, and be one of the following, pregnant, responsible for a child 18 years or old uh, or younger, blind, have a disability or a family caretaker of someone with a disability or 65, eight years of age or older. And when we talk about benefits, I didn't, I don't think I put that chart in here. I have another chart that I did not put in this particular presentation, but it just shows like what, what we have mandatory benefits that we have to cover and then there's optional and that comes from a menu of things that we don't have to cover what we do. And I, in the previous presentation, I had that list. Uh, the one I gave you earlier, on the one side there was those that we have to cover, and then there's those that we don't have to cover. I think we might have had this conversation. I think, yeah, we have it on our That's side, right. right yeah. Okay. So spending, again, another slide you've seen before, but again, like to tell the story, kind of repetition is good. So that 24% of Vermonters is 27% of our total spending. We spend about 6.3 billion dollars on health care. This is a 2020 number. We don't have a 22 number yet. Um, but 27% of that was uh, for Medicaid spending. State budget, again, I think I've shared this slide with you in the bigger presentation, but Medicaid is a huge part of our budget after pre-K. Pre-K is the biggest, um, but Medicaid is close second. Um, but then when you look at the state, from our federal, so the blue is state dollars, the orange is federal dollars. And so for federal, we get the most amount of our federal dollars from federal, uh, for Medicaid. It, it just, it's not pre-K, it's K-12. Oh, I didn't make this slide. Yeah. It says pre-K-12. It says, 12. oh, it says PK through 12. PK-12. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you for the clarification. Um, um, overall, Medicaid expenditures $1.9 billion. Um, it's funded through a combination of state and federal dollars. Um, Overall, across the board, we get um, federal match for different pieces. I'll get into the, the I'll get into the mechanics of that, but roughly seventy percent of our Medicaid program are federal dollars. That's a huge amount. A lot of that is through matching dollars, and, it's, and with this thing called FMAP. You're going to hear a lot about FMAP when you hear from budget adjustment and the budget. And basically, it's, it stands for Federal Medical Assistance Percentage. And there's multiple FMAPs for different programs and for different populations, but ultimately it's the percentage that the federal government pays for a particular program or for a particular population. We do not determine FMAP. FMAP is determined by the federal government on an annual basis. Um, it's calculated on a three-year average of state per capita personal income compared to the national average. Um, and then there's limitations. No state can receive uh, uh, less than 50% or more than 83%. So for instance, states with high per capita income are all around 50%. They can't go below 50%. The federal government will always match at least 50 or more. You have California, your Colorado, your Connecticut. And then you have your states that have not as great of a state per capita income. Uh, Mississippi, you can see they have a very high FMAP, 77%. Our, our, we have multiple FMAP, but the majority of our FMAP, our basic FMAP, is around 56.75%. That's the federal share. Um, additionally, states are also receiving a 6.2% bump in FMAP as part of the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, that is a, the, 
the recent, and Ashley can talk more to this, but the recent federal legislation began the unwinding of that, and we will start to see that FMAP decrease and eventually disappear. But tied to that is this thing called maintenance of effort or eligibility, MOE. And basically what this says is that during this time that we're getting this additional FMAP, we cannot um, change eligibility standards or kick people off or do what's known as redetermination. Mm -hmm. So redeterminations, and you're going to hear about this when you hear about budget adjustment. Basically redetermination termination is a process by which, maybe we talked about it here, I can't remember, but if you think about coming in and then coming out of the program. So you have people, eligibility is determined for people to be in the program and then they redetermine to see if they're still eligible for the program. So normally we have this thing called churn, where people come into the program and then each year we determine it. some stay, some leave, and our Medicaid populations continue to increase over time. That's because the amount of people coming in has been greater than the amount of people coming out. Well, because of this particular uh, benefit right now, we also can't do redeterminations, which means that people are coming on in the program, but they're not coming out. So we're seeing a spike in enrollment, and you'll see that and in budget adjustment. But the flip side is we're also getting federal match dollars to help pay for that as well. So. Um, and I think when you hear the budget conversation, we won't get into the mechanics of the federal bill that's going to unwind that, but that'll be part of the conversation when you hear about the budget when, the, when eventually the administration comes in and talks to you about what's in the budget and the numbers. But that's a big piece that's also driving our budget adjustment. So when you hear about redetermination or churn or why our Medicaid populations are so high right now, that's a big piece of it. We also have um, enhanced FMAPs, um, and these are for our expansion populations. So we have um, multiple FMAPs. We have our, make, our regular FMAP, which is the majority of our program. We have other. Uh, we have um, a children's health insurance program, which is a subset of our. Uh, it's a federal program, but it's, we we administer as part of our Dr. Dinosaur program, which is our Medicaid children's program. But we get a special F map for that particular group, and that's 4,700 4, kids. And another F map we have is for children that was known as childless adults. And don't let the name fool you or childless new adults. They're not new, but the title is kind of deceiving. But it's 47,000 childless adults for which we get this 90 10 match. So, and I'll walk through these again, but basically, in short, you know, F map is, you know, essentially for every dollar we spend, 56.52 cents are federal and 43 cents are state. Or roughly every dollar we spend on Medicaid, state dollar, we're getting $2.30 worth of program. So we're going to put a dollar in, the feds are matching us $1.30, and we're getting $2.30 worth of program. The flip side is, is in the not so, in the years where we've had less, more economic difficulties, and, the, and, and your uh, predecessors had to look at cutting services or cutting, finding money. When you cut a dollar, a state dollar in the Medicaid program, you lose two dollars and thirty cents in services. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, again, we get this. We have a roughly seventy thirty for the Children's Health Insurance Program, and in this ninety ten, um, it was part of the Affordable Care Act, um, and when it first came out, we were at eighty twenty, and then you have states that were. I think they're called the do-gooder states that were already doing expansions. They were getting 80-20 in this population. And then the states that were not doing anything, like Mississippi, were getting 100% federal pay match on these folks. And then over a period of five or six years, everybody worked down to 90-10. We're at 90-10 for this particular population now, uh, for perpetuity. So, the, but it's been helpful because that's a there's a lot of people in this population. Uh, and this does not include the 6.2. This is the base, and then you would add the 6.2. The 6.2 is uh, additive to the regular math maps. You would add 6.2 to the 56.52. We don't get the 6.2 on the childless adults. And then for the children, it's kind of embedded in the formula. So you wouldn't add 6.2. It's more like embedded into the calculation. So it's a little bit different. But not to get too much in the weeds, FMAP is an important part of how we fund our, our Medicaid program. This slide I like because it shows you the cyclical cycle. So <clears throat> there is a correlation between economic well-being of the state and um, FMAP because it's tied to, it's a, it's a more complicated formula, but ultimately it is the 
three-year average of per capita relative to the other, other states. So when our per capita, when our FMAP goes up, we're like, great, we're getting all this extra federal dollars. You know, our FMAP goes up by, you know, 6%, that's $22 million a quarter, it's $80 million a year. Um, it usually goes up by 0.01 or 0.02, but that can translate to three or $4 million. The flip side is when our FMAP goes down, it might cost, you know, three or four, $10 million extra to maintain the same level of service for the same population. But the flip side is, is what I would think about is if our FMAP is going down, which is a bad thing for our state budget, it's, it's one of many sides that means that our per capita income has increased a little bit. So, so there's, there's that sort of thing to think about. It's, it's, it's a bellwether, but not necessarily a complete sign. Um, so you can see that there's like a trend. So the gray years are where our FMAP decreased and the white is where it increased. So you can just see it's kind of done this through the years. Um, and I tried to look at like the relationship between those and recessions. And there is a correlation, um, not a very strong correlation, but there is a correlation. All right, we blew through that quickly, but now I'm going to pass the mic over to Ashley Berliner to talk to you, to you about Global Commitment. Oh, good. That is terrific. And, you know, a lot of, we already have a lot of this on your other slides, but it's so good to hear it again. Yeah, and Global Commitment, you, 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 you probably will have a lot of questions about it. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to make sure there's time. I have two. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, <coughs> Mullen. So um, the goal of mental health is what Vermont calls and a lot of fifteen which is Ashley. Yes. Um, is there a way that you could improve your sound? It's a little bit garbled. Is this better? It is a little bit. It is better. Okay. Sorry about that. Um keep my hair out of the headphones, let me know if you're losing me again. So the global commitment to health is what Vermont has called its 1115 demonstration waiver, which is an agreement between a state and the CMS. The Ashley? Company. Yes. The, the sound is uh, deteriorates when you start to talk. Okay, let me try something else. All right. I'm sorry, I thought that was <laughs> For a second, let me disconnect. Is this better? Yeah, I think the closer you are to your microphone, uh, the better it will be. Okay. Try again. <laughs> um, is this okay? Mm. Still not. Worse. Okay. <laughs> How about this? I guess if you talk really loudly, it'll work. It, yeah, talk loudly it's and slow. slowly, and then we'll be okay. Okay. Can you okay. hear me? We can. Yeah. Is that good? Go. All right. And if you if you start if you start going too fast or it gets worse, we'll stop again. But no, please go ahead. Okay. Let me try one more thing. I'll try corded headphones here. Yeah. Uh -oh. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Is this better? Oh, oh, yeah. oh yes. Woo All right. Excellent. <laughs> okay. So take five. Global commitment to health. That is what Vermont has called its 1115 demonstration waiver, which is an agreement between a state and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, to administer uh, parts of a Medicaid program. So back to Nolan's hilarious joke about if you've seen one, one state Medicaid program, you've seen one state Medicaid program. Um, Every, I would say, I think it's a 47 or 48, it fluctuates, have an 1115 demonstration waiver. They're all called different things. In Vermont, it's global commitment. Most states have a very tiny portion of their Medicaid program under their 1115 waiver. In Vermont, our entire Medicaid program, every single bit of it, with the exception of dish payments, funny enough, is under our 1115 waiver. 
And so what that means is A, Vermont's extremely unique and B, we are able to waive certain provisions of federal law related to Medicaid and how it's administered to give Vermont additional flexibility in carrying out and operationalizing the Medicaid program. Without the global commitment waiver, we would be limited to what CMS approves in a state plan. Um, and we would have to be in strictly in compliance with Medicaid regulations, either fee for service or managed care. So one of the key aspects of any 1115 waiver in any state is that it must be budget neutral for the federal government. So you can't spend more with a waiver than you would have spent without a waiver. In Vermont, an 1115 waiver or global commitment waiver has existed since 2005. Um, since that time, the Choices for Care waiver has been incorporated into the global commitment waiver. So we used to have two 1115s, now we have one. And it really does two big things for the states. It gives us additional money, federal dollars that we wouldn't otherwise have. And it gives us additional flexibility to administer the Medicaid program in a way we otherwise couldn't. So on the money side, we get federal funds, federal matching funds to pay for all sorts of things. And, and here's a not exhaustive list, but the, um, Med marketplace subsidy, Vermont premium assistance for individuals buying qualified health plans on the exchange. The community rehabilitation and treatment program, which is a supplemental insurance product for individuals with severe mental illness, um, providing that above Medicaid limits. V Farm pharmacy assistance for elderly Vermonters who are on Medicare, which is a full prescription wraparound service um, it provides the same prescription coverage as individuals on Medicaid for those at higher income on Medicare. Choices for care, moderate needs, global commitment investment, institution for mental disease payments in Vermont. That is um, for, we have three specific psychiatric institutions, the Brattleboro Retreat, Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and Lund Home. And then we have several other substance use disorder residential treatments that qualify as institutions of mental disease that we wouldn't be able to pay for without our waiver. And in Vermont, there's a, or sorry, in, in federal law, there's a really obscure regulation from the 60s that prohibits Medicaid from for paying for any institution over 16 beds that focuses on the treatment of mental illness or substance use disorder. And so I'm, I'm sure some of you have been here for a long time, have heard about the IMD phase down and IZ, IMD exclusion. And so our waiver is what allows us to pay for, for those facilities. We also have cost-effective alternative authority to be able to pay for services that aren't typically Medicaid covered, but are cost-effective. So an example I always use is something like acupuncture, um, in, which is potentially cost effective over something like back surgery. Um, when we can think about more innovative, lower cost interventions for people where Medicaid wouldn't traditionally cover it, we have the flexibility to if it's been proven effective. We also pay for palliative care services for children above income who are at end of life, substance use disorder coverage above Medicaid limits and permanent supportive housing services. Those last two with the asterisks are newly authorized under the amendment that was approved in July of 2022. And so we're in the middle of plan design and thinking through how to turn those benefits on and operationalize them. They're not currently available to any Vermonters, but we're, we're working really diligently to stand those up and make sure that they're available by 2025. So I'll stop there. I know that's a lot on just the money do you have any questions before I move on to the flexibility or do you want to hold questions to the end? That's up to you, Ashley, uh, whichever you prefer. But... I'm happy to hear questions about the, the financial participation from the feds if, if you have any on those top bullets. Okay, we're good. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry, go back, Dolly, go back. <laughs> on the flexibility side, um, we are able to 
administer Medicaid using a really unique model, which is in Vermont, what we call a public managed care model. We're the only state in the country that does this. Most states contract with an Aetna or a Kaiser to administer their Medicaid program. Some states have 30 different managed care products and plans. In Vermont, instead of contracting with a for-profit managed care or nonprofit managed care organization, we actually contract as AHS, we contract with the Department of Vermont Health Access to be our public managed care plan. Um, that allows us to take advantage of federal managed care flexibilities. It allows us to make payments outside of what CMS would typically approve. So a lot of our innovative payment reform models are because of this. We are able to operate our designated agency system and home health agency system because of a state wideness waiver. We're allowed to have wait lists on the moderate needs population for choices for care. And we're allowed to limit <clears throat> a amount duration and scope to only be provided to certain populations. So things like uh, respite or case management services, you must meet a certain clinical threshold to receive those services. We're also able to waive the upper payment limit, which is a federal provision that says for certain categories of service, Medicaid can never pay more than Medicare can pay. Um, this has been particularly useful in Vermont over the past couple of years as we're paying significantly more than Medicare pays for inpatient hospitals, which is a broad category of service. So looking at any individual code, it might be higher for Medicare than Medicaid, but as an aggregate, that's what the upper payment limit looks at. And we're paying significantly higher for inpatient hospitals uh, than Medicare pays as a program. And that's largely due to the significant amount of funding being provided to Brattleboro Retreat. So if I could just interject really quick, um, this is a lot of information we just, that we just threw at you. And the way that I helped get my head around it when I first understood it, and granted it's changed since then, but as you know, a managed care organization, a traditional managed care organization would be that operate where someone would hire you and hire them and managed care. The idea is that if they can manage the population and keep the cost down, that savings is profit. What we're doing is we are paying ourselves. AHS has hired Diva as a managed care entity. That's the way, it, that's the logistics of how it works. But ultimately those savings that would be achieved instead are being able to use for all of these other things that we're able to reinvest in the population and do these other things. And that's where the flexibility comes in. And the federal government just says, as long as you don't spend more than you would have in the absence of the waiver, you can do these other things with our permission within these guidelines and under these terms and conditions. And that's what the big negotiations are about. And that's what, what cash is. So that's, I don't know if that helps, but that helped me understand it when I first Thanks, Nolan. Move to the next slide. So this is um, kind of a different visualization of the top bullets on the previous slide, which just shows you our Medicaid populations, um, how they are eligible. So the, the first teal box at the top are folks that would be eligible for Medicaid with or without our waiver. Um, some of these are optional groups, some of them are mandatory, but most states cover these categories up to some federal poverty limit. In Vermont, we have a particularly high federal poverty limit for children under 19 and pregnant women, um, but these are, are pretty basic Medicaid categories. Then in the purple, we have our home and community-based services for certain populations. So these are choices for care, developmental disabilities, children with severe emotional disturbance, and people with traumatic brain injury. Again, these individuals would be eligible with or without our waiver. Um, they're eligible for comprehensive health coverage. So everything that the folks above have, the full state plan benefit. And then they're also eligible for an additional array of home and community-based services. So things like supportive employment, respite, case management, um, to help them be 
out in the community and in their homes rather than in an institution. And everything that the feds have done around this purple group, this home and community-based services is, is about taking away the institutional bias and figuring out how to keep people out of nursing homes, out of institutions and in their home and in their community. And then the last two boxes or categories of boxes, the with waiver only, these are things that we'd only, we are only able to pay for because of our 1115 waiver. And again, it's the VFARM program, the marketplace subsidies, moderate needs, community rehabilitation treatment, and then our investments, our IMD payments, cost-effective alternatives, and palliative care under 21. Next slide, Nolan. <clears throat> so the goals of our global commitment waiver are really about advancing the state towards population-wide comprehensive coverage, implementing innovative care models across the continuum, engaging Vermonters in their own health care, strengthening care coordination, and accelerating payment reform. And so we're really trying to make sure that every action we're taking at the agency around the Medicaid program has those goals in mind and are working towards moving the needles on those specific objectives. Next slide. Um, the investments, as, as Nolan talked about a little bit previously, um, these are a broad list of individual projects and programs that have been slowly accruing over time since 2005. And that link there has a list of 67 investments from 2022 that are anything from funding 211 to paying for a portion of the public health lab to providing emergency services for uninsured to mosquito repellent um, on a population level, like the, the spraying that happens. So it's a really um, random list of investments. These have, a, a lot of them were generated as a way to leverage federal funding for programs that previously were general fund only. Um, over the next five years, which is this next demonstration period through 2027, we're going to be really digging into this list and seeing what measures are being collected, whether they're actually achieving the goals that they were set to achieve. In the cases where they are, we're going to be asking if they're scalable, if we can put more money in them to make a bigger impact, or if they're not doing anything or being as successful as we had hoped, can we pivot? Can we invest in a different investment or program or intervention to help meet our objectives. So this is a real focus of the next five years. We're currently um, working with our procurement team to find some really big players in the evaluation space and are looking to have a really comprehensive evaluation and partnership so that we can dig in to the investments and also to the um, more inherent parts of our Medicaid program to make sure that we're using data to, to see that we're doing what we wanna do, which is improving access, improving quality and decreasing cost. Can I add, so as you're talking through this and, and Nolan gave a really good comment about how the savings are invested going forward, there seems to be somewhat of an analogy here with the prospective savings, prospective payments that we see in the ACO and the savings there that then are distributed into the provider community. So it's like an investment into the system only in a different way. So uh, can we think of it? I, I guess I shouldn't bring that up right now, but I think as you look at the ACO and look at, uh, or the, let's not even call it, let's call it the all payer model uh, for value-based payments for overall payments to providers there theoretically makes the use of the funds efficient and so savings accrue and then can be reinvested in some way to the providers in the system. That's kind of the thinking I think that's parallel with what we're doing in, uh, in Medicaid. Yeah, I think I think that's right. The the kind of yeah. motivation in both the investments and the way that we are paying 
as a Medicaid program, at least who are paying one care at the ACO is really about, can we do this differently? Can we do it better? And if you are able to change the way you deliver care, um, can we reinvest in things or invest more upstream so that we can divert costs from the, from the really high acuity interventions like hospitalizations and surgery? So I think the, the investments are really state driven and the idea around the all payer models that it's provider driven, but there's definitely a, a similar motivation there. This is actually a great moment for me to plug an issue brief that I wrote oh, good. over the summer. Oh, good. It's called, uh, it's basically Medicaid, it's Global Commitment a Primer 101. And I actually just asked Alex to post it to the website. And I have um, a paragraph here called the relationship with the all-payer model. And I'm going to read a quick sentence in there. Quick. Not to quote myself, but um, well, we love that. <laughs> to quote myself. <laughs> Um, while global commitment and the all-payer model are two separate agreements authorized by CMS, they are, they are required by CMS to be in sync. So this goes to Senator Lyons' yeah. point. According to AHS, Medicaid is the anchor payer for the APM, all-payer model, sorry, with over 80% of Medicaid beneficiaries attributed to the ACO. So we attribute lives to the ACO. Further, Medicaid and global commitment play a crucial role in the state's value-based payment initiatives that are central to the success of the all-payer model. That's good. That's a great sentence. Thank you. I wrote it. Yeah, you got it. Actually, I wrote it. Ashley probably edited it. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of you together. I mean, this is really helpful because what it does is it begins to help us synchronize all the things that we're hearing from different places. Thank you. Okay. So next slide. Sure. Um, this is what our delivery model looks like in the state of Vermont. I don't know how um, interesting it, this particular slide is, but I think it's worth just noting the organizational structure of our waiver, which says that the Agency of Human Services is the single state Medicaid agency who contracts with a public managed care entity. In this case, it's the Department of Vermont Health Access. DIVA then subcontracts through an intergovernmental agreement, an IGA, with all of these departments and agencies listed on the side. So DIVA is the payer, but it is certainly not the um, program lead of all of the Medicaid program. So it subcontracts mental health, it subcontracts substance use, it subcontracts special education, aging, developmental disabilities, um, and then ch children's services. So I, I think it's important to just note that while DIVA pays for these services, a lot of the Medicaid program is administered across the agency and in the agency of education as well. Yes, the global commitment has its tentacles or it, it plays a piece in almost across almost every agency or department within AHS. Okay. Thank you. And I think that's where you go last slide. Okay, uh, yeah. So this is the yeah, oh, chart, which you see. Wow, we've never everything. seen that before. I put this on everything because we're a lot of numbers. <laughs> uh, but I think this is a good time to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. And again, uh, I will just plug. Uh, I, I, I highly recommend that everybody takes a moment. It's two pages. It's a very high level Medicaid, the Global Movement 101. So. Great. Thank you. Yeah, this is very good. That I put on the web or out. Yeah. No, it's great. And that, yeah, that, 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 yeah. yes, that would be good. And we have that now, Alex. Thank you for putting that out on our web page. You got it. Um, questions from the committee. I, I think I have weed questions, but I did want to emphasize. Yeah, this is down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> I so, you know, I'm in the wetlands. <laughs> But um, the, I, so I might go there a little bit. The uh, one one I think might be helpful, and that is there, everyone hears from time to time about a, a cap on global commitment or what is the cap? What is that cap? Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? I'm looking at both of you, so I'll let Ashley go first. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So it's actually changed quite drastically as a result of our 2022 negotiation. So you're right. Previously, we were really concerned about a, a budget neutrality cap, which is that 
that conversation about we can never spend more than we would have spent without a web without a waiver um and that really tied our hands in terms of thinking about new investments and so for a really long time there was a moratorium on investments we weren't adding new investments it was just like stay the course um, and we were very, you saw those thermometers where we were talking about how close we were to the budget neutrality cap, and we were quite close. Um, as a result of our July waiver negotiation, we negotiated a really good waiver, and we actually were the first state to really push CMS in changing their federal policy related to budget neutrality. And what it looks like now is we can make changes to that cap based on increases in payment rates to providers. So we're essentially held harmless for any infusion of money that we put into provider rates. Whereas previously, if we increased provider rates, that would get us closer to the cap. Now the cap just goes up at the same rate that the provider rate goes up. So that's really great. We also were able to take a lot of services that were paid for, um, from investment into, we're now able to say that we're paying them through program and created just a lot more room generally in investments. And so now our investment cap has a lot more room. And it's why for the first time since I've worked for the Medicaid program, we're really able to think critically about those investments and think about whether there are new investments that we want to make as a state. If I can just add really quick, cap's important to pay attention to because if we go over the cap, which is Ashley mentioned is the maximum amount we can spend in over a time period for this program, if we go over that, we have to use pure state dollars. So we don't ever want to go over that cap. And so that was very restrictive. So what Ashley was just saying is we have more flexibility because there's things we wanted to do under previous waivers like increase reimbursement rates for providers, but we couldn't do it because we were always like, oh, we're getting too close to the cap. The other thing I want to just sort of throw out there is We've been, the first global commitment waiver was in 2005. And now we're in 2022 negotiating through 23, and it is <laughs> through 27. Um, you know, it, and it's supposed to be budget neutral. We don't know what we would have spent in the absence of the waiver. It's been going on for you know, almost 20 years. So it's a negotiated amount based on, uh, you know, calculations done by CMS and AHS. And so, you know, the state pushing, you know, to make sure that we have the most generous cap is 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 really an art versus a science at this point. So, kudos to I would say that loud. I said it most much. Kudos to HS and Ashley and the team for getting what they got in this waiver. Like, if you don't understand what we got, it's like great. But when they got this recent one, we were all like, wow. So, we were so. Yeah, I can. They deserve a pat on the back. I, I do, I do, and I do want to pat Ashley in particular on the back for the work that she's done. So, thank, thank you. you. It would be fascinating to know the process of how one gets the waiver. I'm sure it's an art form. Well, every state, I think the last time I looked at it, 40 states mm -hmm. have some form of waiver. And as Ashley mentioned, we used to have two. Um, we're the only state that has a whole Medicaid program. So, for instance, other states, they might just have the small population, and we're going to do a waiver just for that population. We had one for Choices for Care, which is mostly, you know, old, older folks with different needs, and a lot of states still just target a specific population. We're the only state that said, we're going to put the whole kit and caboodle into one waiver. Go ahead. I would, I would just add to what the chair and Nolan said. I was at a a national conference, the Medicaid Leadership Conference, and I gave a little brief presentation on our Medicaid waiver and the rest of the states there, and this was national, um, 26 states I think were there. Um, everybody was blown away by what we're able to do with our Medicaid program and our waiver. And some of the states who wanted to do more came up to me and, how do you do that in Vermont? And could we do this maybe with a region of our state? Um, so. I, I agree, um, kudos to Ashley because it and whoever else was involved, the secretary and others, because it's it's a really great waiver that we're able to do a lot. If you look at that list of investments that we're able to reinvest, and if we could figure out a way to do this with our entire healthcare system, it would be amazing. 
Well, yeah, you're right. And as as, I, as we were talking about earlier, you know, moving in that direction, if if all if we can get private insurance uh, in synchrony with what we're doing, as well as through the um, value-based payment programs, uh, we'll be light years ahead. But right now, the rest of the country, every time we talk with people, including CMS, Vermont is way ahead. And it's just, uh, it's neat. And here we have Nolan and Ashley, and they're ours. It's great. Thank you. I think one of the reasons we get away with, we're able to do that is because we are a small yeah. state, Port, so the yeah. federal government sees us as a very little financial risk. Yeah. yeah, other states were like, oh, we could have a county or two doing this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> a town. Yeah, I'd also just say that, like, we are way ahead. We, we were really big thinkers, and we have been for decades in the state around healthcare. But one of the areas we're really not ahead in is our systems, our data systems, and our data collection and analysis. And so that's something that I think you're going to be hearing a lot from the agency over the next little bit. You've already heard a lot about it, but we need to get better at our analytics and evaluation and really making sure that those investments are doing the things that we want. And so Senator Hardy, if they're not, can we pivot it to a different part of the healthcare system? Like we're just not, we haven't done a good enough job over the past 17 years in that space. And I think this new waiver is really going to be a time for us to dig in to the data and make sure that we're data informed. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right, Ashley. Thank you for saying that. So that is exactly the direction we're hoping that X167 in some ways will take us, as well as looking at quality metric analysis in a broader view and integrating data sets that haven't been fully integrated. We don't want to put them all together, that's not the goal, but to at least make, make the uh, clinical data accessible for um, outcomes, improvement of outcomes. So yeah, we're, we're, all, we're, we're all getting there. This is good. Senator Weeks has a question. Uh, just a, a question. So you, you mentioned uh, 60 some odd investments. Can you give a couple examples just to kind of give it some? Tell you what, I would pull the sheet up. Yeah, um, so 211, the, the statewide hotline we pay for, we pay for um, dental, for people who have met their dental cap, their $1,000 dental cap, um, who are at extremely low income. We pay for things like the designated agency's ability to provide emergency services to uninsured, underinsured. Um, the public health lab gets a lot of funding from Medicaid. The statistics this team at the health department gets a lot of funding from Medicaid. It really runs a broad spectrum, but those are some examples. Oh, that's helpful, thank you. If you go on the link, I'm struggling to get it for. Um, if you go on the link on the prep, yeah, go on our I saw the link. I just wanted to yeah, yeah, interfere with a concept. It's a long list, and it's in like one font. <laughs> yeah, one. But it's about, we have you know, 100 and something million dollars in investments. But you can find that at the JFO site. Uh, I will send Alex the link to post. Okay. We'll get that on our web page. Yeah. That's great. Any other questions? Senator Bullock? No, actually. Uh, <laughs> Senator Williams? Whoa, this is good. See how, what clarity brings? Um, thank you. I, d I have some questions, but I'm just going to throw them out there and then we can talk about them sometime uh, as needed. Um, I'm always interested in what Medicaid support we have for those in our correctional facilities, because that's a, an issue in particular uh, support for MAT. So that's, that's one, uh, and I know, I know there's some of that. Um, the other one is, uh, is, there, is there a regular, <laughs> don't, don't laugh at this question, is there a regular increase in the federal percentage can we ever expect something beyond a negotiated increase in uh, federal support? Are they, the federal dollars, are, we don't want a CPI for any of this. It's all negotiated state to state every other the year. F, the FNAP is not negotiated at all. So right. that's what Nolan was referring to in the beginning of his deck, where it's based on you know kind of the health of the state economy. It is not negotiable. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, and so we can we cannot move the needle at all there. 
Um, on the on the DOC thing, just quickly, the corrections and inmates. Sure. There is a federal prohib- prohibition on using Medicaid dollars for inmates of an institution. And so we're largely um, tied from being able to use any Medicaid dollars in a correctional setting. The CMS under the current administration has started to think about um, loosening that restriction a little bit. And so we're having conversations with CMS currently about how we might be able to pay for inmates in pre-release. So like 60 or 90 days ahead of their transition back to the community, what can we do to get them into care and make sure that care is seamless? Um, CMS hasn't greenlit anything yet, but that's something that we hope to be able to come back to this committee um, within the year and and say that we're able to put some money into investments. Um, this is true. I know that I had the room filled with all the DOC and agency folks about four years ago, maybe five years ago, where we talked about this and now to have it move forward is I mean, it does take time to get all of this organized. So, you know, thank you for that work. That's really important. Yeah. And I know that Senator Sears on Justice Oversight is very sensitive to it as well. And just Judiciary Committee. That's good. Okay. Anything else? I would actually sorry I just want to say I think Nolan touched a little bit on the unwind and the fact that Medicaid's rosters are a bit inflated right now because we haven't been able to redetermine anyone over the past three years that's going to be changing in May we're going to start renewing folks and so I want to just give you a a sneak peek of testimony that we want to make sure we get in front of your committee which is what our plan is Um, people for the first time in Vermont are going to, in three years, are going to be receiving notices saying that they have to reapply for Medicaid or that they might be losing their Medicaid coverage. And so we're definitely going to be coming back with what that plan looks like, what the communication looks like to Vermonters, so that you are able to talk to your constituents who might be reaching out nervous about notices and understand kind of what the agency is doing to make sure folks are educated. Uh, thank you for that. And so make sure that you connect with Alex so that we can get you in on an agenda in a timely way. Because I know, we all know, we're going to hear from everybody in our districts about this. So it would be good to know what the communication process will be for you and what, what the plan is. So thanks. It's good. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Ask a question with Ashley. Ashley, has there been any conversations at the federal level of increasing the percent of poverty for eligibility for Medicaid. I know there is in some limited programs um, goes up to a higher level of poverty, but for the overall Medicaid program, Mm -hmm. it's still quite low. And like I said earlier, the Medicaid program we have is so good. And if we could get more Vermonters eligible for it, it would be helpful. So is there any talk of that happening? Not that I'm aware of. That would have to be a congressional um, law. And yeah. as we know, they're not going to be doing that in the next two years, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are we are able to kind of work around the fringes there, though, with our premium assistance up to 300%. So it's not as good as Medicaid coverage, but we're providing premium payments for individuals up to 300%. We go up to 317% for children under 19, which is huge. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we're allowed, we're able to pay for bits and pieces of services, regardless of income through our investments. So I would say like all Vermonters benefit from those investments and some of them more targeted than others, but a lot of those Um, kind of indirectly affect everyone regardless of income. But no, short of Congress at the federal level passing a law expanding Medicaid, uh, which feels pretty unrealistic right now, we can't really do anything. And I know that the the new waiver has the increase in uh, income eligibility for substance use disorder treatment. And what is the timeline on that? Do you think that's going to be approved? Uh, you know, final approval soon? Because I know it was still an asterisk in your list. So it it was approved and we're really excited about that. So we're the only state in the country that has a a federal approval to pay for substance use disorder treatment for folks above Medicaid income thresholds. 
This is a brand new benefit though. And so we are in this early stages. It just got approved in July. We're in the early stages of working through what are the services that we're going to cover? How are we going to enroll them in our Medicaid plan? What are we going to pay the providers? How are we going to identify the providers? So it's an enormous amount of work, not to mention our really old IT system that takes a long time to program. And so I just say all that because the 2025 date feels far out, which is what we're slating for, 1-1 of 2025. Um, but there's just a lot involved and our IT system makes it really difficult for us to move faster. Now, January 1st of 2025 is when you think that's going to be available. Oh, wow. I'm just thinking in context of the opioid settlement advisory committee and whether we would be able to count on any, but it sounds like no, um, not for two years. Not for two years. I will say we're current, we're currently paying about $10 million a year in investments to provide a kind of less efficient version of the same benefit. So through the division of substance use at the health department, they are doing a lot of work to get services to this higher income population, but it's not quite the same. It's not as streamlined or accessible as what we'll be turning on in 2025. But that's not to say it's not available at all right now, because it is. And does it include MAT and the medication for, for um, uh, Medicaid assistant treatment? Med yeah. Medicine, medical assistant, MAT. MAT. <laughs> um, so there, it would, but there really shouldn't be anyone other than folks who are uninsured in Vermont, which we have very few of, who who don't have MAT, MAT coverage now. But the Medicaid coverage does include include coverage yes. for that. The yes. investment, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Good. Okay, that's good. I mean, that's helpful. But the other, if it's 2025, remember that the advisory committee is going to come up with something, and maybe next year, maybe this year, there'll be something that goes into place through appropriation. So it might actually be very close. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead, Senator. Just to get us mentally prepared, um, what do you have a sense of how many folks are going to be redetermined? They do. Percentage wise. Every Everyone will be redetermined. 100% oh, okay. of the people on Medicaid will be redetermined. Um, our kind of preliminary data, which is not sufficient, is that we think about 29,000 people will fall off. Um, but we don't have a, a complete picture of the data. We only know, you know, the limited amount of information that we know. So... I think that's why um, Deputy Commissioner Stro Stromolo will need to come in and really talk to you about the plan around it. But a hundred percent of Medicaid will be. I, no, I was looking for the twenty nine. I mean, the twenty nine thousand, which is what percentage approximately? No one's the math guy. Two hundred eight. Uh, well, okay. Uh, no, no, yeah. one hundred sixty eight is primary. So. Okay. 15 or 60 percent yeah 15 percent right thank you okay are we good no. i think um alex we can go offline we'll take we're gonna take a little okay thank you it is um this is the senate health and welfare committee back uh january 20th and we're moving on to hear from dr john soroyan who from the blueprint for health and so dr soroyan welcome We'll go around and introduce ourselves and then uh, have you uh, introduce yourself for the record. So, Hello, I'm Martina Rock Hulick. I live in Burlington and I serve Chittenden Central. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Dave Weeks, Rutland County, and I come from Proctor. Terry Williams from Rutland County, I'm from Pullman. Ruth Hardy will be in in just a minute from Addison, and well, she's not in Addison right now, but she'll be back in. Uh, and Ginny Lyons, who and we have met. Um, uh, John Soroyan, uh, Executive Director for Blueprint for Health. Okay, so you're going to give us the Blueprint 101, and uh, we look forward to it. Um, so are you going to share your screen? Good. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting me to present to the committee this morning. I have been looking forward to reviewing the blueprint with you all. The statutory framework for the Blueprint for Health was established in 2010 through Act 128. The Blueprint has 15 years of experience as to how, how health care is distributed statewide. Through research, design, and implementation of innovative healthcare delivery and payments models, the Blueprint remains a multi-payer, whole population program that can develop and test healthcare reform initiatives. As an innovation engine, it has implemented concrete and durable changes to treatment delivery, payment models, and healthcare information systems, particularly related to integrated primary and community care. The Blueprint for Health is ambitious in its goal for Vermonters primary care providers to be supported in taking a long-term, whole-person approach to care, one that addresses medical, social, and mental health needs and provides access to a range of supportive services in an integrated fashion. For primary care providers, the Blueprint for Health can encourage an expanded focus on the needs of the entire population they serve. The program has offered support through delivery system reform and payment models that give primary care the ability to invest time and resources in team-based, data-driven, quality-focused care. In accompaniment to this slide, you all should have an additional document entitled Blueprint for Health Internal and External Return on Investment. This is a topic I plan to return to in the future, Senator Lyons, but did want to let you all know that the external and internal evaluations that have been done for Blueprint for Health are been done robustly and showed positive return on investment. And I, I will leave this for maybe a future discussion if that's Absolutely. okay with you. Yeah, good. And Thank you all, of course, are welcome to. Um, the Blueprint Executive Committee is defined in statute by the members representing departments and agencies of human services, including the Department of Health, Department of Mental Health, and the Department of Vermont Health Access, as well as a representative from the Green Mountain Care Board. Two private health insurers are represented, healthcare professionals who provide health services are represented, as well as healthcare associations and consumers. Um, Representative um, Lori Houghton is uh, an individual appointed jointly by the President Pro Tem of the Senate and Speaker of the House of Representatives, and, and she joined our committee last year. Health service areas represent the areas in which patients receive their health care and historically have de been defined by which hospital they have been discharged from. This is a term among many that I included in a, a glossary for you all that's quite particular to the blueprint. Blueprint utilizes health service areas to help ensure that resources are distributed across the state in a way that is accessible to most people. Also shown here are our current program managers. And I'll talk to you all about program managers and define their duties as well. Are each of these folks uh, at a hospital or? Two of them are at federally qualified health centers, Madam Chair, and the rest are at hospitals. Thank you. Of course. Uh, each administrative entity hires a Blueprint program manager to oversee Blueprint activities in their health service area. The program manager is the primary contact locally responsible for management of all programmatic and administrative components of the agreement. They provide support and help in the development of effective strategies in alignment with grant and program deliverables. They establish key relationships with patient-centered medical homes, a term that I'll be defining more completely soon, community partners, regulators, and governmental agencies. The Blueprint Program Manager is also the key liaison for Blueprint trainings, strategic direction, coordination, and support in developing and spreading best practices. Next, I will be reviewing Blueprint programs, including the patient-centered medical home model and quality improvement facilitation, community health teams and defining uh, them, as well as payment systems for both, the hub and spoke system for opioid use disorder treatment, and also the pregnancy intention initiative. And if I haven't said it before, I, I say it now, I'm happy to um, pause and entertain questions whenever um, you feel is appropriate. No, it's up to you. Okay, right. I'll, I'll keep going. You're in charge. Um, 
The blueprint was founded on the establishment of patient-centered medical home recognition by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Practices that meet their standards have been shown to help better manage chronic conditions, improve quality, and are associated with lower healthcare costs. The blueprint supports practices that become recognized as patient-centered medical homes through supplemental or additional payments to support their work. They still bill the way they would normally bill, and these are supplemental payments, and I have a, a very detailed slide about all those amounts and, and, and that background. These payments are made by public and private health insurers directly to the practice. The practice and practitioners um, know their patients, they understand their health history and needs, their preferences, and those are taken into consideration as prevention strategies, new and long-standing health care needs are met in context with their goals. There's also expanded access to the provider and care team through electronic communication, extended hours, after hours coverage, and screening procedures are done regularly based on the patient's age and gender. There is assistance with managing various specialist referrals, referral follow-up, care planning, as well as coordination of that care. All together, it's an approach that emphasizes and supports informed decision-making, motivational interviewing, the patient-centered goal-setting, and self-management of chronic conditions. The blueprint also supports the patient-centered medical home practices with a quality improvement facilitator. This is a professional who uses evidence-based tools to help the practice meet key healthcare quality metrics and make sure that they are maintaining their recognition as a um, medical home. Uh, just to um, interrupt you here, but to let folks know that your script is also on our webpage. So you have the slides, and then you can also have the script, which is very helpful. Sure. Sure, and the glossary of key terms, and the glossary. which I refer to frequently. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we love it. And it's also very carefully referenced. Thank you to my team. So, shout out to them. Um, okay, payments, patient-centered medical. The patient-centered medical home payments that the committee sees on the left side of the screen represent the current per member per month amount paid by commercial Medicare and Medicaid payers. The commercial and Medicaid payments have not been increased since 2016. The Medicaid payment is higher than the commercial payment because it incorporates a pre-existing uh, payment for managed care services. The Medicare amount is based on available shared savings amounts um, that are determined from the all-payer agreement. Half of the performance payment, so this is the middle um, text that you see, patient health care utilization, is based on healthcare utilization of the patient population of individual practices up to 25 cents per member per month. So that number is multiplied by everybody in their, their, their clinic that falls under these categories. And the other half is based on hospital service area population, healthcare quality measures also up to 25 center cents uh, per member per month. To give the committee an idea of how these payments might accrue for a small practice of providers, for example, I, I took this from an example of maybe two physicians, one nurse practitioner, or just uh, on, the, on the smaller side. I present you with an example of the dollar amounts per insurer as well as the total per month that would be paid. And again, this is an example, this is not an actual practice. This funding is used at the discretion of the practice that medical clinic, the doctor's office, uh, in, in more uh, commonly used terms, um, related to maintaining that, that high level of recognition as a patient-centered medical home and activities therein. I'm, I'm, I started with the, the darker green um, circle, which is uh, where people receive their care. Um, I'm moving now to a slightly lighter green circle that I'll, that I'll go through with you all to um, uh, show you the next layer of funding that's directed um, by the Blueprint for Health, which is the community health team. The community health team supplements the services available in the, in the medical home and links patients with social and economic services that make healthy living possible for all Vermonters. The community health team staff are intended to provide supports and services that are not generally covered by insurance 
at no cost to the patient and without regard to insurance status. These staff may include social workers, coordinators of their care, mental health counselors, dietitians, community health workers, and other types of professionals who provide and support whole person care. The community health staff are intended to provide supports and services that are not generally covered by insurance. So these individuals working for the community health team do not bill for their services when they're in their role for the blueprint. And there's no um, money extracted, there's no bill for that service that the, per the person would get. And it's provided without regard to insurance status. I have status. a question and you have a question. My, my question is how is the care management facilitated from the service to the outside ring? And then Senator White, go ahead and harder ask your question and we'll try and get um, some My question was, so, the, the slide that you showed where the, for how the payments work. Should I go back to it? Sure. Yeah. Is this all the, um, the 2,300 people at the bottom, is that all the patients in the practice, regardless of income and regardless of, of uh, what, you know, how often they're seen by the clinic, et cetera? Um, it is not all the patients in the practice. And the second part of the question was how often they're seen. Say that part again. So this is uh, so. Who are they? If they're not all the patients, yeah. how do you? Sure. How are they? So the the total of number of patients who receive the majority of their primary care services um, at a specific practice within the past twenty four months, um, the blueprint has a, a methodology that um, the insurers, the payers, follow to uh, combine the individual with their payer. So there are payers, for example, for some patients who um, are exempt from the statutory um, inclusion of, of being a blueprint provider um, payer, and, and those payers do not pay in. So we have a very specific formula that's followed. It's a look back of 24 months for a primary care visit that qualifies and if a person is insured by a certain type of insurance offered by Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, Cigna, all of Medicaid, all of Medicare, then that um, individual is included in this attribution model. So it's only the patients who are covered by these types of insurance. Um, and the the and this is in my glossary of terms as well. Individuals for whom there is, um, and this this part's always good to drill down on, so thank you for, for pointing it out, that it's for individuals who are wholly insured. So this is not include, is inclusive of individuals for whom their, their employer, let's say, is in a uh, administrative services only or um, claims-based way of paying. This is individuals who, who have health insurance that are, um, do you mind if I show you in the glossary where it is? Sure. It's hard for me to explain that extemporaneously sometimes. It, it's just, it's hard for me, it's, I'm not understanding who the patients are that so are covered. Um, the, the blueprint attributed po patient population is the total number of patients who've received the majority of their primary care services from the providers in the past 24 months, and that number is used by participating insurers to determine the, the practice's caseload. Excluded from that would be things like, um, um, a, a um, sorry, I'll get there. A third party administrator, so a company that contracted a, a health insurance provider to perform just the administrative duties of, of payment. So, because my health insurance is from a, um, a self-insured employer, um, I wouldn't be an attributed patient for the, pra the primary care practice that I go to because my insurance is not through one of those. Um, so the presence of your visits during a two year look back, that you know, out of one would not occur in, a, in, a, in that arrangement of self-insured payers. So I would not be included. I'm trying to get you to say this in simple language, and, you're, and you keep saying it in complicated language. Oh, okay. Um, so 
because I, because I my insurance is through a self insured insurance plan, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be I wouldn't be counted as one of the patients. In the attribution. If the if I were um, uh, on Medicare or Medicaid or or had my primary insurance through Cigna, Blue Cross or MVP, I would be counted, mm -hmm. and it, regardless of income, mm -hmm. whether I made twenty thousand dollars a year or two hundred fifty thousand dollars. My knowledge. Year. Yes. Okay. If. And you still receive the services. And what if I don't go every year? What if it's only every other year? Is it only patients, any patients who's who's technically an enrolled patient at a practice, or is it do you have to actually have had a visit during that it's year? It's a two-year look back. It's a 24-month look back. It's a two-year look back to have had uh, any kind of uh, oh, it's visit a, to so the... It's a super, super long list of different types of visits. Okay. Yeah, that, that fall into... The, the rubric and, and actually we we even include yes we include a, 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 a wide variety of codes for for what counts as a primary care visit okay so yeah this is very good this is helpful um, if if her self-insured coverage includes blueprint coverage then that is it does that happen um, I don't any, know of a self-insured program that, that is a payer because okay. they're 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 exempt from yeah. from, yeah. from totally contributing. Exempt, but they if they wanted to welcome Let's to the talk. Club. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's all. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't I don't know that we direct payments from any. No. I look at all of them. And yeah. Don't remember seeing. Mm -hmm. okay. Good question. Okay. So the state health insurance plan are state employees or the NEA. That's a third party administrator arrangement, and yeah. to my knowledge, that's not a. Um, yeah, a blueprint. To my knowledge, it's not. And the same with the teachers, and yeah, there are a lot of people that Hello. might be included. Yeah, okay. Community health teams? Or do you have a question? I'm sorry. So yeah, no, it was, just, it was just about care management. I, sure. was, staying at the, I was staying up at this level, so. Uh, yeah. yeah, And how it's, uh, how it's paid for and coordinated. And you've got a health care, a health team there, so whether it's SASH or the Hub and Spoke, um, let's not go over there, someone. You have a, you have a nurse care coordinator. Mm -hmm. Is that the person that helps to connect each patient with the external um, care that they need? It, How does that work? Sure. Um, there are care coordinators that are in the clinic. If that's a if that's a priority to how the clinic is expending um, its resources, there are also care coordinators on the community health team, and those individuals would make sure that they're not overlapping or doing duplicative services. But they would um, they'd work in concert and decide who who has the expertise to to manage that person's um, issues. I, I as I. As you may not know, I, I, I visited um, every site except um, two last year and learned in quite a great bit of detail the, um, the implementation of these programs specific to care coordination and other services and how practices work with community health teams. And I, I saw both models of care coordination. I saw models of care coordination, which is fine. Yeah. Um, um, I saw models of care coordination where the individual was in the practice and I saw models where the practice would reach out to a care coordinator in the community, but external to their physical location for assistance with figuring out referrals, following up on labs, helping with transportation, et cetera. Okay. I just thought of a question I sure. should ask somebody else because you oh, okay. popped it in my mind. Go ahead. All right, um, community health teams um, supplement the services available in the patient-centered medical homes and link patients with social and economic services that make healthy living possible for Vermonters. The community health team staff are intended to provide support and services that are not generally covered. And I'm realizing I've read this already. I think I will go to slide 14. One of the key functions of the community health team is to serve as an access point to specialty supports and services already existing where the patients live. So, Despite it being blue, the outer circle is not um, does not represent um, <coughs> agencies or, or uh, groups that receive funding directed from the blueprint. But this is the the um, community supports and specialty supports that our community health teams link individuals with, and these may include um, food, uh, housing, transportation services, specialty and disease um, 
uh, management um, and the other aspects of this, this slide. There is uh, the self-management program, which is an exception to what I just said, um, that actually is a link between the Blueprint for Health and the Department of Health. Um, the Department of Health implements local programming uh, for the Blueprint um, about self-management at myhealthyvermont.org is where um, sign-ups for all the different hypertension, diabetes, and other self-management and education programs are, which are evidence-based and led by facilitators. So the payments, the blueprint support staff of the community health team by directing public and private health insurers to make payments to the administrative entity, a term which I haven't defer, defined yet, but I will, in each region of the state. Usually the local hospital, but not always. Sometimes the federally qualified health center is considered that entity in a health service area. Blueprint funded program managers oversee the outflow of funds to local practices to make sure that the needs of the community are being met and the practices have the appropriate level of support. Medicare funding availability has not kept up with the past payment increases of both commercial and Medicaid. So in the middle slide in the dollar amounts, um, one can see $2.77 for commercial insurers um, and $2.77 for Medicaid and $2.51 for Medicare. And I'm gonna show you uh, a next sort of a similar type of slide as I did before, it's an example. On the, uh, the left of your screen or the right? On the right side of your screen, I share with you three different ways by which staff um, can be um, employed. One is the actual entity receiving the money directly hires the staff member and deploys them. The second is that the entity contracts with a local provider such as a designated agency and what we call a pass-through uh, of those dollars. And then the other is that the, um, the clinic or the, the practice itself receives funding to hire staff that it chooses and, and hires. How, how, are, sorry. how are the uh, <coughs> administrative entities at the local level chosen, the hospitals versus the FQHCs? And how are practices, how do practices become part of the blueprint? And how do you ensure sort of equity across the practices that are part of the blueprint. Mm -hmm. This is a concern I've heard in my community that not all the practices that are part of blueprint feel like they get as much support and attention and resources. Equitable treatment. Yeah. Yeah. That as others and, and there's concerns about who's sort of is controlling it at the local level. Um, the first question regarding how administrative entities are chosen um, Historically, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, in my year of being the executive director um, and my visits to all of the, um, uh, except for one, administrative entities, I, um, I, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of administrative work. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of, uh, uh, administrative entity takes on a great deal um, to manage the funds that are directed and what I heard as I, as I went around the state was um, to do all of this work John we need more we're investing our own dollars in in administrating the funds you give us um, and so historically it would be something maybe you could bring back to us at some point it could be it yeah. could be and it I, I can, yeah, I can certainly ask. I don't, I, I don't know how that, that came up. I can certainly ask and bring up. And I, I have to, in, with my team and with my own work, make those assessments to see um, how well are they following our guidelines? How well are they participating? How equitably are they distributing things? How responsive are they to, um, to corrections or changes that we might suggest? Um, but I, I, I certainly can ask my team and, and, and bring it back to you. I don't, I don't know the origins of, of the beginnings. How do practices become a part of the, um, the blueprint? The program managers are tasked with the responsibility of reaching out to all non-participating practices on an annual basis. They're also charged in their quarterly reports with um, um, uh, giving some mention of, of, of that, though it's really an annual reach out that they're expected to do. 
And I'll just give you an example of a practice that was interested. The discussion usually be begins with the program manager. This, this uh, person wanted to speak to me, so they came to Waterbury and met with me for an hour to review the Blueprint program, similar to the presentation I'm giving you all. And um, that's, that's where the discussion begins. And then the assistance comes in a person on the team that I haven't spent a lot of time speaking about, but is known as the quality improvement facilitator. The quality improvement facilitator really works intensively, uh, especially in the beginning, but also over time, so that the, the practice can meet the high standards in its own practices and policies and procedures of becoming a, a patient-centered medical home. So that's, that's the process on that side. The equity across practices question um, in terms of how dollars are distributed by the community health team is an area that I've taken a lot of uh, interest in, in, in myself and, um, and asked those questions of both the administrative entity and in some cases tried to listen to practices themselves either that reach out to me or that I've heard don't feel like they get their due. Mm -hmm. um, and those are, those are tricky one by one um, situations that as an executive director I need to make a judgment myself about how far I go in, how far I coach, how far we support um, the program managers and the practices with what the rules are to make sure the rules are well understood and well implemented. Um, and that's, that's an ongoing, ongoing part of, of my responsibility to continuously with the team evaluate when those concerns come up, encourage people to bring them to me because they do. Mm -hmm. um, this is precious resource. People can, practices can feel on either end, um, and and um, I'm not sure, uh, Senator Hardy, if I'm answering your question, but it's a, it's a it's an ongoing oversight of, mm -hmm. of of funds where, as executive director and as a team, we have to remind people of the rules of the state, and we also have to work with the administrative and entity and program manager to remember that it's it's all the blueprint practices in their area. I feel like for the most part, I've been very fortunate that um, that hasn't come up too, too much, but, but it definitely it definitely does arise. And you, do you have some kind of evaluation process for the local administrative entities and the practices themselves? So, so this, so an evaluation process for the administrative entities, I do not have an evaluation process that I know of. This year I am planning on, and I haven't begun it yet, meeting with the CEOs and the CFOs of every administrative entity um, to review the rules of, of engagement with, with the Blueprint. Um, I found that uh, last year there were so many new people in leadership positions and uh, that pandemic and the few years before the pandemic that um, that frequent content attack with the executive director and why things should be spent on what they are and what the rules are, that these are state-directed dollars um, um, have, have been uh, followed. I, I will share with you the next time I come a distribution, I, and I don't have that slide today, but I will, I hope the next time I come, share with you how the community health team dollars are spent by different positions. That, that's something I think um, yeah, the committee will be, be interested yeah. in. But that was what I was very interested in last yeah, year. I know. And we spent, we spent much of the year collecting that information mm -hmm. so that we know how are these dollars being spent on what, where. So, um, and the outcomes. So yeah, this is good. I think it's, this is a great introduction to that conversation that we will have. So um, and why, don't you, why don't you just you know, okay, so sim similar to the um, example I presented to the committee for the medical home payments, this slide depicts, and, and again, this is, this is uh, to some extent, a, I, I made this, this up based on a number of different areas, um, what, what one administrative entity um, could receive um, based on their attributed population, so not their entire population, but the, the attributed lives that, that meet the formula for Blueprint. So on a monthly basis for the outer ring of kind of darker green for them to hire or pass through or, or pass along dollars, they might be receiving as much as $107,000 monthly. Um, and those, those payments are sometimes put quarterly or monthly. This dollar amount is what it would be um, on a monthly basis. This is a 12,000 attributed patient population. I would 
that's that's still on the small to medium size. This, so I'm, I'm, I kind of weighted my slides more towards uh, health service areas that were um, not geographically smaller, but the, the numbers are um, the service is smaller. If, if, if we move to a different county, I might have a, a, an attributed patient population of well over 100,000. So um, those, are, those, are the, those are the dollars. In addition to the community health teams, there are two additional key programs sponsored by the blueprint that patients may interact with in their medical homes. The Hub and Spoke is Vermont's system of treatment for opioid use disorder with nine regional hubs under the direction of the Department of Health, as well as daily support for patients with complex addictions. At over 75 local spokes, so these are office-based um, treatment of opioid use disorder, um, doctors, nurses, and counselors offer ongoing opioid use disorder treatment that is integrated into their health care. This really reduces stigmatization um, and contributes to their whole wellness and normalizes the treatment of opioid use disorders as opposed to separating it out from what, what people may feel is regular, in quotes, a medical care. So it, it, it normalizes the inclusion of that service into a medical home. This framework utilizes medications for opioid use disorder um, for treatment and deploys expertise in addition to that, counseling and care coordination um, into the community and links them to the specialty centers, the, um, the so-called hubs. As you can see in the right-hand column here, there's been quite a growth of patients that have participated in the SPOKE program since its um, inception in 2013. You know, while we're talking about this, I know that, uh, that Senator Hart is very much involved in the use of the dollars we're getting from our uh, the first pharmaceutical settlement. Oh, and the opioid okay. settlement agreement? Yeah, so, and one of the questions that I asked at a meeting with it was Diva folks, um, and Ina Backus was there, I think, is are those dollars able to be matched, Medicaid matched? And the answer is yes. So that will have a, an important, um, that, that's important for us to know, and particularly here where we're looking at having spoke. Anyway, just, just an aside. The Pregnancy Intention Initiative helps ensure that women's health providers, medical homes, and community partners have the resources they need to help women be well, avoid unintended pregnancies, and build thriving families. In 2017, um, what was then called the Women's Health Initiative, what um, we're moving the name to something that's more inclusive, I'm calling it the Pregnancy Intention Initiative today, was begun in an effort to increase the intended pregnancy rate. As of 2020, the intended pregnancy rate in Vermont was 57.1%, an increase from 55.9% in 2018. Um, and, and on this slide, there are multiple components um, that you can see of the program that include family counseling, psychosocial screening, intervention, and then referral and assistance to um, other services that might, might be needed. Um, central to the um, the data that is collected and the counseling that goes on, excuse me, the assessment is the would you like to become pregnant in the next year, which is known as the um, part of the pregnancy risk assessment and monitoring system. Yes? Just to make sure I understand this, you're saying that intended pregnancies are not even 60%, so over 40% of pregnancies in Vermont are unintended? That's correct. How's that compare with other states? Do we know, can we get that data? Sure, yeah, yeah that seems, uh, yeah, that yeah. seems pretty good. Sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll just make sure I have that next yeah. time I come back, and if it's a link, I'll, I'll send it to Alex. Perfect. Very simple. Yeah. The, um, uh, as of 2022, Attributed patients um, numbered uh, 22,000, and, and payment schemes include a dollar 25 per member per month, um, which is just, uh, um, goes to those practices. There's also support for staffing um, through the community health teams 
for the Women's Health Initiative when it's in, in a medical home. Alternatively, um, some OBGYN practices in the, um, in the state participate, and they, they actually receive um, funding directed by the Blueprint to hire a mental health clinician. Um, there's also a, um, uh, a one-time per member per month, uh, excuse me, one-time per member payment to support those practices in keeping in their inventory um, effective contraception as well as long-acting reversible uh, contraceptive devices. Thank you. So maybe you could just talk briefly about the hub and spoke. I and mean, we will be looking in here if that bill ever gets finalized. Um, the expansion of hub and spoke to include more than opioids. I mean, that's my bill, my, my intent, and I know it's maybe it's synchronous with yours. So could you just talk a little bit about how the hub and spoke works sure. on the ground. Sure, so the hub and spoke model um, was considered a, a novel approach to the um, um, services of evidence-based medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. So that's that's where it started. So opioids, and I'm, I'm, that might be a little jargony, um, morphine, heroin, um, uh, over the uh, prescription, oxycodone, oxycontin, um, medications, um, certainly in, in my practice, uh, when I was practicing, that I, I, I sort of saw people develop use disorders from. So the, the, the treatment of um, that type of um, use disorder has a, um, a medication uh, known as buprenorphine in addition to other medications that um, in my physician uh, brain is, is quite elegant. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a medication that um, prevents withdrawal and also um, can have a, a very, uh, not for everybody, but for many people, a very uh, quick effect of being able to stem their, um, their addictions, their use disorder. Um, so the Hub and Spoke pro program was developed to increase the number of buprenorphine prescribers in, in Vermont but also to provide individuals who, who are struggling with these use disorders um, the option of counseling and also the, um, the option of, of care coordination because there are um, frequently not just a, a use disorder that's going on, but um, perhaps mental health needs, other medical conditions like hepatitis um, to really coordinate their care. The hub is the specialty area um, and those, those, are, um, those are distributed around the state for individuals who need uh, daily monitoring and daily medications. And that would be, for example, someone whose mixture of different medications reached such a high dose, perhaps that they, they really weren't fit to be seen every week. They needed to be seen every day and monitored closely. Jenny, how this book isn't unique to Vermont, is it? Do you want to talk about yes, it? yes. how it how it how it's, it's, we it's, it's, with that in the country? Been, <laughs> it's it's been hard to keep up. Um, multiple states nationwide have replicated Vermont's um, model, and other conditions have have utilized the terminology hub and spokes beyond uh, use disorder, both in the state and I saw the term hub and spokes used in California's uh, uh, wellness for aging report. So it's um. It's, taken it's not off. trademarked. No, it's, it's taken <laughs> off. It, 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 Vermont really is a leader in this area. And that's why I wanted to emphasize it a little bit. And we're learning the, the need for mental health counseling as well. So that we may be seeing that in, in the in legislature. And, and I did emphasize it in my slides, and I, I, I probably should have, though it's, it's very much in the glossary, the um, Pregnancy um, Intention Initiative, or this Health Initiative, and also um, the spokes are funded um, only by one payer, um, Medicaid. So um, similar um, to what I, I probably didn't speak to as directly as I could have around medical homes, um, every person who comes into that clinic setting receives services um, only individuals um, with with Medicaid um, 
kind of draw that additional um, piece of funding. So, so, so if, if someone has coverage from MVP and they go into the hub and spoke system, then they're only covered as much as their insurance. Um, so that that's a that gets very much into the particulars, which um, yeah. are hard for me to speak sure. to. MB, MVP has, um, if my memory serves me correctly, um, MVP uh, has more than just fee for service okay. billing. I believe another commercial insurer in the state does too. But is it but in, but field? In, do they have something? I see, I see I, Rebecca over here. Saying, I think yeah. so. I think it's MVP. But it's 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 not every single patient that's served in scopes. I think it's more limited um, to certain areas. But certainly they still bill um, for fee for service, they still get billed for medication. It's this additional support staff that's primarily in terms of blueprint directed funds, and those models are outside my, my scope sure. of knowledge yeah. um, or um, um, Medicaid only. Okay. Yeah, good, thank you. I know historically, uh, I think back to the origins of this, and we used to sit here and listen to people who had to travel two hours a day to get their methadone treatment. They had, you know, if they lived up in the Northeast Kingdom and the only place they could get methadone was in Burlington or, or they had to travel down south or from the south. So it was really inappropriate for the care that they needed. And so that gradually the hub and spoke evolved and then the type of um, nice. treatment, drug treatment would also evolve from there. And then we've changed who can who can do what when within the hub and within the spoke. It's been, it's been an evolution, but all, the whole time your office, you and others who have been in that office have really demonstrated significant leadership um, for us and then across the country. So, like, um, very, yeah. Sure, yes. Okay. Can you give me an example of a uh, patient sided medical home? Um, sure. Um, um, should I start with a, a, a place or should I just start generally? Any, so, any place you want? Oh, well, the, um, the federally qualified health center um, is a patient centered medical home, the uh, Hogan Camps. Um, uh, sure. I've spoken to a number of times and um, when I was listening to them, I, when I did my site visit to Rutland in October, I, I told both of them that they speak more eloquently about patient-centered medical homes than me. <laughs> um, I, I was, I, and I, I followed up with them since. Um, I, I, I was in touch with um, Dr. Bullock as well. Um, we spoke in, I think, in December. Um, that's a patient-centered medical home um, as well. So those are those are just some some examples in in Rutland. I I, I did. Uh, Warn um, the Hogan camps that they spoke so eloquently that I, that I may, um, I may recommend they speak, <laughs> okay. and certainly uh, that would that would be. But they're just. Um, oh, okay. I, I've probably okay. spoken to thirty or forty or fifty clinicians over over time, and I, I think the, the the two of them put it in more concrete terms than I ever could because that's what they've seen it. They've seen it change their practice. They've seen it uh, help them rise to a, a higher level of. of delivering whole person care than their training and all their, their good work as, as physicians could do alone. What, what might be helpful is to get their contact information to Alex. So rather than, we have- Yeah, I might warn them first. Please, oh no, if it's, it's, if it's appropriate. Yeah, uh, yeah. But to, to probably come, it could be on screen, but to- mm -hmm. um, Oh sure, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I'm happy that. to do that. And because we're, we've got field trips planned, but that one might be another one. We could oh. do it next year, but it would be, I think, more appropriate to get them in a little bit earlier. Um, the, the pediatricians that I've spoken to around this state, um, too, I'm thinking of, um, should I say people's name on the testimony? I don't want to put them on the spot, but I, I've spoken to If they're to, professionals and they're part of your system, it's probably okay. Oh, okay. You don't have to say their name. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking of um, Dr. Haig in, in uh, Enosburg, yeah. and similar to, uh, I forget the Hogan Camp's first names, but the Doctors Hogan Camp. Uh, I, I have been lucky enough to meet both community health team members and providers um, who, who speak about these programs and are 
able to share professionally, personally, the impact that they've made on an individuals in their practice. That was, that was definitely the, in addition to Scout Camp, that was the best part of my year last year was making um, health service area visits, community health team visits, the, the stories that people tell and my shock at listening to how much support they gave individuals in the, their communities. Um, in, in a couple of cases, they actually, um, I'm just sharing this, Senator Lyons. No, this okay. is terrific. So, I, I've, I, 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 my, my beginnings were in pediatric palliative care, children who were terminally ill and had serious pain, and that's, that's what I did. Um, that was my work. Um, I, I worked in hospice for uh, similarly uh, about eight or nine years going into people's homes. For me to be astonished at the coordination that teams are giving individuals uh, around us, uh, I've seen a, a lot. And um, there's a lot of things I wish I could unsee. Um, so to hear stories about the, how far they were going to keep, for example, someone home until they had placement in long-term care, um, and to do it regardless of the person's payer type, their insurance, um, to, to measure that impact is, is, is close to impossible in terms of sort of dollar objective terms. To hear the stories um, is, again, for, for, for me being uh, not, not callous, but rather seasoned as a, as a clinician having seen a lot, they, they sometimes wondered why I was having such a astonished reaction because their response was, Dr. Soren, we do this every day. We, they, we yeah. do this every day. We help people achieve their goals yeah. every day. That's our work. Wow. So we, we did take a field trip as a committee a few years ago to Gifford, and there's a wonderful... Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. So, yes. You, you yes. I can, I, can, I can show um, them. Gifford, they call it the community help team. Yes. I think she, and there I, I talked to the same person you did. Did you? Oh, I thought I did. She was taking over for incredible. the retiring, and mm -hmm. she's uh, unbelievable in the, the gift that she gives to her community and to her patients. Yeah. So, so um, it's, it's, um, it's been a very rewarding transition for me, stepping away from, uh, which is hard to do, 20 years of direct service and, and, and supervision. It's, 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 a, it's hard to step away from that clinical work. The stories and the individuals I, we get to support um, certainly make, make up for it. And, and, and I think Senator Hardy, back to, to your point, knowing that their executive director, their leader, their team centrally is energized, is paying attention, is going out and visiting them and helping them problem solve when, when things come up that are um, good and sometimes more, more points of disagreement. I think that that's been a very energizing um, component for our Blueprint funded staff. And it's, it's, it's enjoyable, it's good work. Sorry. Two more. One more. <laughs> oh, right. And they're they're flexible. The the plan is flexible enough so that they're making it work. Sometimes by themselves. Yeah, and 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 I think that um, I'm not sure where this is going uh, with your question, but um, for for me, having served in pediatrics and then also in adult hospice, one needs to look out for one's colleagues so that they are. Um, not setting boundaries, that's probably too strong of a term, but sharing the work with their team, speaking up when they're needing more help, because the inclination is to help that person until they've been helped, which is amazing, but can also, um, I, I talked to more people who said they've been on the community health teams for more than 10 years. I, I mean, it's, it's it, the person you're talking about, yes. you've heard I'm thinking of Bennington. Yes. I mean, I can, I can start picturing multiple people that I met they're like, no, this is this is where I, I this is the work I do. This is this is where I am so, now. Yeah. Well, it's a powerful statement about who we have in our medical community yeah, sure. and in our community services. We're so committed to people. And I, I think that um, I think that uh, mental health came up, yeah. um, and 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 the, in the broadest of, of senses, um, not just individuals with a diagnosis or a, a certain something, or other, but just support someone to talk to, someone to connect. There was one uh, individual who um, calls a member of the community every day um, to check in. 
Now, is that is a physician? Is that a? I, I mean, it doesn't matter what the, I don't. There doesn't even have to be a diagnosis. But for her to call and check in with that that individual every day, five ten minutes, that's what that person needs. That's what that member of the community health team does. And then there's other people that that, that might spend hundreds of hours supporting individuals. It's, it's it gets to the point where sometimes it's it's hard to to um, even for me to, to believe. But that's what that's what our community health teams do. I'm sorry, you had other questions. I was just wondering if you could give me an example, some a couple examples of the homes in the Burlington area. Mm -hmm. I um I did a um and, and pardon me for not remembering practice names as, as well as I should. There was a, a pediatric practice, I believe, in Essex that reached out to me in my first month. Um and I don't want to make up the name under testimony. Yeah, and um the, what they do with community health team dollars to really individualize care for children and families is above and beyond what, what they get. And, and they certainly were making the point um, of, of, of saying, you should be doing more. Um, 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 the practice that I visited, um, uh, Dr., Dr. Stein is uh, on the opioid resettlement, is that Advisory. Advisory so I visited where Dr. Stein works, the, the Federally Qualified Health Center, so that's Community Health Centers of Burlington. Yes. yes, I was wondering. And we spent, we spent a, a few yeah. hours there, and um, wow. Okay. Yeah. And <laughs> it's fun. It, yeah. it's, 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 um, it's, it's inspiring to, mm -hmm. to see what, what individual teams and practices, and I could, I could go on with, with other ones too, but those were, the, those were the ones that I reached out to most, or they reached out to me in one case, I reached out to the other uh, um, with the Federally Qualified Health Center. Here's what we'll do, you know, this is really, this is sparking a lot of interest, so if you can get some names of folks who could come in and share their experiences within the, and define for us, uh, very practically a community health team. Yeah. That'd be great. I, I don't know how much time we'll devote to it, but we'll, we'll do that. It'll be like our field trip into the Blueprint Community Health It sounds Center. like I should recommend a couple people to speak just to the patient-centered medical home, or would yes. you rather? Yes, or, no, that's so good. both. Okay. Yeah, and then a little bit of the other, but sure. we'll, we, we'll always do triage here and figure out what we can. Sure, I can, I can give that to you probably Monday. Say, yeah. yeah, send it right to Alex. I'll send it to you, Alex. Sure. Yeah. All right. So this is great, and I greatly appreciate the time. Again, you're coming in, and it's been quite an evolution since last year. <laughs> Glad you're here, and thank you. And you enjoy your work. Sorry. You obviously enjoy your work. Oh well. Yeah. Thank you. So Alex, we're we're good to go offline, and thank you all. This has been a good morning. Great morning.